Happy International Human Rights Day and welcome to the HRA webinar um, that is focused on freedom of assembly with a focus on the right to protest. We're so delighted that you're making time to, um, to be with us today. My name is Felisa Tibbetts and I'm Executive Director of Human Rights Education Associates, HREA. And um, I'm very um, pleased that, um, that the team at HREA, including um, Stella Huang, who organized today's webinar, has been di diligently working on organizing our monthly webinars over the past six months so that we can actually deliver um, education and learning around human rights, um, in addition to providing resources to, to support your work in that area, which we'll tell you more about um, later on in the webinar today. Um, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that today in International Human Rights Day, we obviously had a lot of choices to make regarding what topic to focus on, but the decision to take up the right to protest essentially, which our speakers will address in, in great detail, reflects our great respect for human rights defenders and the roles they play worldwide in promoting and defending human rights. The fundamental right to freedom of expression, assembly and association continue to deteriorate year after year worldwide, according to a global report released earlier this week by Civicus Monitor, an online research platform that tracks fundamental freedoms in 197 countries and territories. The new report, People Power Under Attack 2021, shows that the number of people living in countries with significant restrictions on civic rights including the freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly amount to almost 89% of the population this year. Very, very sobering statistics. So at Human Rights Education Associates, our mission is to promote education and learning as a tool for prevention in human rights. And part of that is awareness about some of the conditions that human rights defenders have to struggle under. Our webinar today will go for about an hour. I do wanna let everybody know we are recording it. <laughs> so if you would not like to have your image um, in, the, in the webinar video uh, recording, please uh, turn off your camera. Um, this recording will be made available on the HREA website. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we will be having a question and answer period after the presentations today and and if you have any question or questions that you would like to offer the panelists, you're welcome to put them in the Jamboard um, at any point during this presentation. So you'll see in the chat box, a link to the Jamboard. Some of you already submitted a question upon registration for the webinar. So we've already captured that. But if you have an additional question or if you didn't get a chance to put one in beforehand or a new one occurs to you, feel free to use the Jamboard and we'll get back to that later in the webinar. So um, thank you again for, for joining us today. Stella, I'd like to turn the, the, the floor over to you. All right, thank you Dr. F uh, TV for opening the webinar. Uh, I'm so excited to celebrate the Human Rights Day with you all and with our incredible guest speakers, Toby Mendel and Fetri Jane. So before we dive into the presentation, I'd like to show you a short video about Human Rights Day, which briefly summarizes this story. So Dr. TV, please play the video if you're ready, please. Thank you. Uh, I think I can, yeah, I can My do it. My apologies. Can you do it? Sorry. <laughs> sure, no problem. Thank you. All right, here we go. Um, I think I hear some sound. I think someone's playing the music. Sorry about this. Someone's playing music. I uh, you, the host, you, can, you can you can mute everyone. Oh, okay. Elisa, would you please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Let's go again. Oh. 
People around the world regularly struggle through periods of environmental and political turmoil. The United Nations undertakes global humanitarian efforts to try to help those in need, regardless of age, gender or nationality. The United Nations Human Rights Council had its beginnings in the post-war efforts of leaders around the world. It all started with the United Nations Commission of Human Rights in 1946. Then, two years later, Eleanor Roosevelt championed the adopting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights amongst 48 UN member states. Now, people the world over possess the fundamental freedoms of speech and religion, and the freedom from fear and want. This Human Rights Day, appreciate the effect of those efforts by leaders such as Eleanor Roosevelt on your local communities. Get out there, make a difference, and help those who are less fortunate. Together, many small actions can provoke worldwide change. All right, so let's dive into the presentation. Uh, let me introduce our guest speakers. Our first guest speaker is Toby Mendel. Um, he's the founder and executive director of a Century uh, for Law and Democracy that is international human rights NGO that provides legal and capacity building expertise regarding foundational rights for democracy including the right to information, freedom of expression, the right to participate, and the right to assembly and association. Prior to that, he was for over 12 years a senior director for law at Article 19. That is the international human rights NGO, focusing on freedom of expression and the right to information. He is also the author of a large number of articles, monographs, and books on a range of freedom of expression, right to information, communication rights, and refugee issues, including several books published by UNESCO. Our second guest speaker, um, she has more than 20 years professional experience working on human rights in Africa. She oversaw Article 19 work in West Africa and with the African Commission on Human People's Rights and established the regional office of Article 19 for West Africa in Senegal. She has delivered the technical assistance to government, uh, governments on human rights, reform of media law policies, and freedom of, exp of expression, access to information on the African continent. She is the current chair of the board of directors of the Jambia Radio and te Television Services and member of several boards and committee of human rights institutions in Africa. She's founder of the Center for Women's Rights and leadership in the Jambia. So let's get started with you, Toby, first. Please feel free to jump in. Okay, so thanks so much and happy Human Rights Day uh, to everyone. Uh, the topic of our uh, conversation today is on uh, freedom of expression and the right to protest. Um, I have to say uh, where I am, which is in the eastern part of Canada, it has snowed 40 centimeters yesterday. So I feel very sorry for anyone who was planning to protest yesterday or today. It would have been very quite messy, but no, just a joke. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a bit of a philosophical reflection on uh, the freedom of expression and the right to protest, and then I'll get into more uh, practical details uh, after that. Um, and uh, as, as some of you might know, the most recent uh, general comment adopted by the UN Human Rights Committee, and the Human Rights Committee is the body that oversees implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, so the, the one that guarantees, the main one that guarantees both freedom of expression um, and uh, freedom of uh, peaceful assembly, um, is on peaceful assembly. Uh, and in it, they state that uh, the, the right to the peaceful assembly 
is more than just a manifestation of freedom of expression. So that's the claim made at, towards the end of that uh, document. Of course, that's understandable. Uh, the, the document was on freedom of assembly. It has a separate guarantee in international law. Uh, so I guess we might presume that it's different or goes beyond just freedom of expression. Uh, but I actually, and within my own organization, by, by chance, we were discussing this the other day. I wonder to what extent that's actually correct. Um, and I think that um, it's the expressive element of a protest or of an assembly that distinguishes it from just a bunch of people walking down the road. Um, I, 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 I was trying to think, is there any such thing as an assembly which does not have an expressive element? Uh, and I, I'm not sure that there is. Um, so, um, of course, there are specific attributes to expressing yourself through protest or through assembly, just as there are specific aspects to expressing yourself through broadcasting or through the internet or through any other means. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not just a manifestation of freedom of expression. Um, so I, I, I think it's kind of an interesting philosophical uh, opening gambit, if you will. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, maybe not another time we'll have a discussion just focused on that and perhaps I'll write a paper about it. Um, okay, in terms of the textual guarantees in the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, um, that is Article 19, 2 and 3 for freedom of expression and Article 21 uh, for uh, uh, the right to peaceful assembly. Uh, they're very, very similar in nature and I will point to a few of the differences. Um, firstly, as I keep saying, uh, assembly is guaranteed only to the extent that it's peaceful and I'm gonna come back to what that means uh, in, in a little while. Um, uh, there's no such condition on freedom of expression, at least not in the text of Article 19. And I don't think that issue has been dealt with comprehensively by any international or regional court. Uh, please correct me if anybody has an, uh, an, an example of that. Um, I do know that the Supreme Court of Canada, for example, has held that violence is not protected under the guarantee of freedom of expression in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, although the court did recognize that violence can be an articulation of, 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 um, of, of meaning. It is an expressive form or it can be an expressive form, but it's not protected as such. Uh, I don't know whether uh, that would be the case under international law. So that might be uh, one difference, a more limited scope of protection for, for, for assembly. Um, uh, when it comes to the three-part test for restrictions on both of these rights, so uh, neither of them are absolute rights, they both permit of restrictions, um, again, uh, the language is very similar, although there are a couple of differences, not sure how significant they are. Um, both um, uh, require uh, restrictions to be provided by law or set out in law. The language is a tiny bit different. I think that that's basically the same. Um, they also both require restrictions to serve a legitimate interest. So you can't restrict just for whatever, you can restrict only to serve something. And the list of legitimate interests is almost identical, the one difference being that assembly may also be restricted to protect public safety, whereas freedom of expression doesn't include that language, but freedom of expression may be restricted to protect the rights of others, and I think that largely would cover public safety uh, as, as in as much as that's a restriction for, for assembly. So I don't really think that's a difference either. Um, and then finally, the test requires any restriction to be necessary to protect one of those interests. So that's, that's the same in both of them. Interestingly, uh, for uh, assembly, uh, the restriction must be necessary in a democratic society, which I think if anything is a higher standard of necessity, so a more stringent test. Um, although I would note that the language in 
um, general comment 37 about necessity is almost identical to the language that the Human Rights Committee uses when it talks about um, restrictions on freedom of expression. So once again, although we can find some minor textual differences, um, I, I'm, I'm doubtful that there is much, uh, much substance to those uh, differences. Um, so uh, looking at some of the other similarities uh, and, and pot potentially differences, um, both of these rights impose what we call negative and positive obligations on states. And negative obligations are not negative in the pejorative sense of that term. They're not sort of you know, bad or morally or, or sort of you know, bad or negative in that way. Uh, they, they're, they're negative in the sense that they constrain state behavior. States should just allow you to uh, express yourself uh, and to assemble uh, without you know, restricting it, except as permitted. Um, uh, and uh, they also impose positive obligations on states. So it's not enough just for states to stand back and let things roll. Uh, there are circumstances in which states must do something to protect these rights, to create an environment in which these rights can be fully realized. Um, and that uh, is, is um, uh, the same for both of these rights, and I think it's important to recognize that. Um, so th with those preliminary comments, I'm going to spend the rest of my time looking at some specific features of uh, these rights and how they, they interact and, uh, you know, features which I think are, are, are somehow important. Um, so I already mentioned that uh, one of the at least textual differences between the two is that the, 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 the right to peaceful assembly is exactly that, and the word peaceful appears you know, explicitly um, in that right. Um, so it means that uh, violent assemblies or violent protests are not protected by this right, uh, and that violence can be violence against individuals, other people, or violence against property. Um, but it doesn't mean that as soon as there is some instance of violence, a protest is no longer protected. Uh, it falls outside of the scope of protection. Uh, the, uh, the violence, first of all, must be serious. Uh, and the UN Human Rights Committee has said, you know, pushing and shoving and things like that are not enough uh, to meet that standard. It must be, um, you know, uh, higher than that. Um, and um, the violence must be uh, significantly widespread before a protest as such loses protection of the right to uh, peaceful assembly. So it's not you know, just because some individuals engage in even serious violence, for example, uh, you know, the, physical violence against someone else or breaking windows or stealing uh, property or whatever. That, just because a few people are doing that doesn't mean that the whole protest uh, falls outside of the scope of protection. Uh, if there's some limited violence, uh, the, the role of those that may be policing the, a protest is to stop that. Uh, and to continue the otherwise protected uh, the protest. But at some point when the violence becomes sufficiently widespread, uh, the, the protest itself will be uh, uh, no longer deemed to be a peaceful protest and will fall outside of the protection. Um, I, I think it's important to note that uh, what often happens in the context of protests is that uh, it's the protesters themselves that are being attacked. So they're not engaging in violence, but there is violence being perpetrated against them, whether it's by uh, the authorities, the police, by uh, provocateurs, by counter protesters. And of course, counter protesters are also protected because they're protesting too, but they may be the ones that are instigating the violence or just citizens, uh, whatever it is, the uh, emergence of violence against the protests can never take that protest outside of the scope of, pro of, of protection. It's not the protest or the core protest uh, which is now being violent, it's, it's just receiving violence. Um, and uh, here, uh, it, herein uh, arises one of the primary duties of the state to protect. Uh, when a protest is subject to uh, violence or when a protest being planned is likely 
to be subject to uh, a violence or attack. Uh, the obligation of the authorities is to protect that protest or that assembly uh, and not to uh, you know, ban it or stop it or prevent it. Um, and the language uh, used in this context by uh, the UN Human Rights Committee is that, that the extent of that obligation on the state goes unless the state is, quote, manifestly unable to protect the protest. So it's a very significant obligation on the state. The state must use its power, uh, and it's the only actor in society which is allowed to use force, so it must use that power, uh, whether through the normally through the police, but in exceptional uh, circumstances can also engage the military to protect that uh, protest uh, and stop the violence against it. Uh, but if it is manifestly unable to, to do that, uh, then uh, it may uh, take measures. Um, uh, the state must clearly demonstrate that. It, it's not enough simply to say, oh, no, we can't protect that demonstration. Or, that demonstration is going to be too, too problematical. Uh, they must really show that. And the standard of proof, the necessity test, uh, you know, requires clear demonstration uh, by states. Um, and even then, Banning the demonstration is the absolute last resort, and it's the analogy of prior censorship in the space of freedom of expression. Uh, prior censorship is not absolutely ruled out under international law, although it is in some, uh, uh, or almost is in some of the regional conventions, for example, the Inter-American uh, Convention on Human Rights only permits prior uh, censorship of expression to protect children and not in any other context. Uh, but otherwise, it, it, and the European court, for example, and other courts have uh, expressed significant reservations against prior censorship. So banning a, a protest is, is the equivalent of that. Uh, and if, if the state really cannot protect the protest, then postponing it or perhaps moving it to another location uh, could be intermediate uh, measures instead of doing that. Toby, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know you have about a minute left. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You said you were going to give me three minutes. Um, I couldn't couldn't okay. get in there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no problem. Uh, so, and and uh, I think it's important to mention that the the role of monitors, so journalists watching a demonstration, or or civil society groups, or whomever may be monitoring, including monitoring what the state is doing, what police are doing, for example, uh, that is a they are protected by the right to freedom of expression, and they, that is a separate phenomenon from the protest. So even if a protest becomes violent and is therefore subject to be banned, uh, the, the right of journalists, for example, to report on both what the protesters now, violent protesters are doing and what the state is doing uh, remains a protected activity. And indeed the, the, the police or the authorities are required to protect them just as they are required uh, in any context to uh, protect uh, those who are expressing themselves uh, against uh, attack. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think, and just, uh, and just one uh, final comment that when it comes to restricting uh, both of these rights, um, two areas of restriction, national security and public morals are legitimate and applicable to freedom of expression, but are hardly applicable uh, uh, to assemblies. Uh, that's because unless a, a, an assembly is violent, in which case it's not protected, for other reasons, uh, it is almost uh, impossible that it should threaten national security, whereas speech acts of, uh, of other sorts can actually threaten uh, national security. And the same is true uh, of, uh, of public morals. Uh, certain uh, expressive acts can threaten public morals, but it's hard to see how a, a protest could do that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. I probably went over by a minute, but I was uh, not giving quite the, the advance warning I, I was uh, expecting. Uh, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us, Toby. It was inspiring to hear that. Uh, if you have any questions following Toby's presentation, please follow the link on the chat box to make a questions to Toby. We're going to have a QA and a session at the end of the webinar. Now, thank you. Please feel free to begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. 
Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy uh, Human Rights Day. I'm very pleased to join this uh, panel of human rights advocates to share my thoughts on this important subject. Uh, Toby uh, has already laid the foundation on uh, some of the legal aspects on the right to protest in relation to free expression. I just want to reiterate that uh, throughout uh, history, protest has been often uh, helped in. Protests have often inspired positive change across the world and has also improved the protection of human rights. And uh, this continue to define and protect civic space that is more and more threatened across the world. And we've seen, uh, Felicia mentioned it, the recent report of Civicus and many other reports that uh, civic space is shrinking and there have been a lot of uh, repression around the world on protests because I think many government understand and also they see the power of protesters. And I think it is also an important element of the right to freedom of expression. It is important that protest is protected. Uh, it has been used to challenge many arts in society, uh, repress, uh, challenging repressive regimes, demanding for democracy. And we've seen it throughout history from slavery, uh, anti-colonial movement, from dictatorship. People tend to get some energy all across the world whenever faced with uh, challenges, unfair treatment, injustice to protest because they do believe that most of the avenues that are laid in our society sometimes do not provide uh, necessary redress. And we've seen it with elections. Sometimes everybody will say, or many people will say, yes, people can change societies through election by deciding who they put in power. But sometimes we believe that that is not enough. You, through democratic means, people are put in power, but they use all those tools or the attributes of democracy to perpetuate themselves or to use the, the state to perpetuate injustices or not to be accountable to the citizens that voted for them. So I think this is why also it is important that other avenues are explored. And I think protest has been one of those to enable citizens to express dissent, their grievances, when they feel that their opinions are not heard, when they feel that uh, their voices are left behind, or when they feel that they are only poorly represented or marginalized in their own society. Uh, but yet governments around the world too often treat, uh, treat protests as an inconvenience to be controlled. We know the power of protest, so government, instead of facilitating, because uh, we know that they have positive obligations to create an enabling environment for protests to, to, to be conducted in peaceful manner. But generally what they do, they try to control and also to ensure that also they quash on those voices not to exercise their right because they understand the impact of protest and how it can shake society. This right involves the exercise of many other fundamental human rights and it is essential for, the secure, for securing other rights. Of course, we mentioned it earlier uh, in the discussion to be mentioned because it's quite linked to the right to expression and all the fundamental human rights. Few protests also are though free from violence. Sometimes you can see protests that intentionally were quite pacific or peaceful can turn violent because it can be infiltrated or sometimes you have pockets of violence. And what we've seen across the world, people, governments, they use those uh, uh, violence uh, within protests or the infiltration to crash on protesters and sometimes to use uh, uh, legal uh, legal means to, to, to prosecute those who are only protested, uh, protesting uh, peacefully. International standards, uh, uh, I will not come to that too much because Toby already mentioned quite a lot about, about uh, the, 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 import, the international standard. But just to say that uh, uh, the many human rights standards uh, allow for res uh, restrictions that are, uh, that are, that are limited. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the limitations should be 
quite quite uh, 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 as to be mentioned in line with those standards. But what we've seen, they they should be narrowly defined. Uh, they should be really limited uh, to ensure that the right is not undermined itself. But despite all those guarantees, it has been widely recognized that state need more 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 guidance because of the nature of protests, the regularity in which people are protesting across the world. I think uh, governments more and more need more guidance, more elaboration to ensure that they implement their international obligation uh, whilst allowing uh, citizens to, 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 to protest and to uh, exercise their, their rights. Uh, the bodies across the world, we mentioned already, uh, the, UN, the, the, the General Comment 37, but also uh, in the regional, in the regional board, the regional bodies have also uh, contextualized some of those uh, guidelines. And uh, within the African continent in 2017, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights adopted uh, the guideline on the right to freedom of assembly and association for, with, for two reasons, to clarify uh, and, uh, and, and also strengthen the obligation set on the Article 10 of the African Charter, which uh, provides for the right to association, and also Article 11 of the Charter, which also uh, association and uh, Article 11, which provides also for right to assembly. The combination of those two articles association and assembly uh, has you know, given the birth on the, the, the guidelines, which uh, in fact derive from a lot of best practice internationally, but also look at uh, the context uh, of, the, of the continent where we've seen a lot of protests over the past decade that have really shaken you know, from the Arab Spring, what we, we've seen what happened in Tunisia, across West Africa, we've seen quite a lot of protests uh, in Burkina, where two, two protests, uh, 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 many decades of uh, dictatorship ended uh, through protests. We've seen also in the Gambia in 2016, the true protest people, you know, galvanized, so mobilized to, to go through election, to election that uh, ended 22 years of dictatorship. So I think uh, it is important also to know that governments are quite scared about protests because they do believe that it can also be a game changer because when citizens are not so happy and when they are they take to the streets i think it can also change quite a lot of things and those changes are quite something that many governments also across the world particularly in africa are quite scared of so that is why also sometimes the excessive use of force is seen across uh, trying really to discourage uh, protesters Another thing that we've seen, uh, what are the challenges? In fact, what, one other thing that we've seen also, uh, governments using quite a lot of legal measures uh, to, 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 to restrict uh, the laws on public order, because most of the constitution caters somehow for the right to protest. Some are very bold, some are uh, a little bit timid, but when you look at it, the right to protest, the right to strike, the right to assembly generally are, are provided in most of the constitutions across the continent. But what we've seen is that there are other laws such as the criminal code, so other, other public order laws that are really restricting these rights and making it so difficult for citizens to exercise them. More than more also we've seen anti-terrorism laws that are you know, proliferating everywhere uh, on the continent also making it so much difficult for people to protest and to, to, to assemble. Uh, recently with COVID-19, we've seen uh, the enactment uh, of emergency laws. Some were done according to law through the National Assembly after debate. Some were done in ways that were really uh, you know, unorthodox and uh, they continue really to, to undermine the, the right to, 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 to protest uh, in, in many parts of the, the continent. Also, what we've noticed beyond the legal restrictions, we've seen a lot of other, other, other operational difficulties, uh, uh, such as the lack of training of security forces, and they are not prepared to face, because most of them also are not trained to, 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 to desescalate uh, uh, violence or you know, confrontation with protesters. They, they do crash on protesters. They do use excessive force uh, to, to really uh, limit the, 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 the scope of, of the, the protest. And we see, and there are more and more protesters are more and more 
seen as troublemakers and uh, the use of force is sometimes done to discourage protesters, but also to punish. Another element we've seen also in many parts of the, the region is that also there have been infiltration of, of protests, protests, trying to delegitimize peaceful protests. And that also has a consequence of putting the protesters or those who organize the protests in a situation of uh, you know, conflict with the law, because then when the protest gets violence, generally those people are arrested and prosecuted for you know, uh, violence. And these are things also that are used, tactics that are used by governments or uh, security forces in many places, really also to, 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 to undermine the right to public pro to, to protest. Uh, the brutality, of course, we, we, we've seen it across, uh, especially even against women. We've seen many, many places where when women are part of the protests, also they are dealt with in special manners. Also, I think to discourage or to send like a, a signal that uh, you know no one will be scared, spared, and women can can also that, that could also be uh, frightening and and discouraging for 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 future protests. Uh, the, the 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 use the use also of uh, smearing uh, many 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 in many places protesters are demonized. They are seen as uh, unpatriotic. They are seen as criminals, and that also is amplified by generally mainstream media that that are used also by government or you know, government agency also to portray an image of protesters that is really also not uh, uh, positive. And that also create like a, a, a situation where, you know, people are scared of protesters and protesters are not supported by the general public who see them as troublemakers. So I think all these things are also uh, uh, um, uh, major factors that are, you know, undermining this important right uh, for so the citizens have to, to to express their discontent, their 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 anger, and sometimes also the the, the lack of satisfaction vis-a-vis uh, -vis of those that are governing them. But again, in sort of putting an enabling environment, there are a lot of hurdles, a lot of obstacles, and when those are not enough, generally the government resort to to means that are really brutal to to ensure that they 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 do deal with uh, protesters. Uh, to, 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 to ensure that they are silenced. Um, to, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. You have three minutes left, just let me know. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, and uh, uh, the last point that I want also to, 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 to raise is that uh, the role of digital, uh, it uh, offers new opportunities, but also presents some challenges. You know, uh, they are now used a lot. Digital is used a lot as a crucial media for enabling protests to take place, for people to organize, to create platform, to protest. And protests generally are not necessarily done, you know, physically. It can be also digital, but also digital can be used by the protesters to organize, prepare, raise funds, and, and, and get a lot of uh, support. And I think uh, this is also an important element to, 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 to put into account. But another, another setback also, it, it can also be used by government uh, also to, 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 to have for surveillance, but also to, to, to undermine the, this right. So I think in as much as it is important and it is very useful for, for those protesting and for pro-democratic groups, we also have to bear in mind that governments also can use digital also to infringe and potentially violate the right uh, the right to in, in protest by infiltrating, by uh, you know illegal surveillances, but also by ensuring that you know they violate the, the privacy of those people who are involved in in protests. I think I will stop here, but just to reiterate that this is an important right that needs more protection. The guidelines that we have across the world are quite progressive. They are enough if implemented. But I think we need to do a lot of public education, a lot of uh, human rights education, especially of security forces, to ensure that they understand that uh, the right to protest is part of the democratic, uh, you know, discourse, and it is important that they play their their role. And sometimes when protests happens, people are not intended to destabilize the countries or to to put uh, the situated country in chaos, but just to express their view and they have a role to play and they must also respect uh, 
especially the guidelines on use of forces, because you've seen a lot of abuse of forces and lots of use of lethal force against for peaceful protesters across the continent and across the world. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your expertise and realist um, perspective and all your hard work uh, to advocate freedom of expression, Betchu. So now let's move right on to the question and answer. So we collected some of our great questions. Let me share my screen quick. Here we go. Now you can also, um, again, click the link um, in the chat box that we will lead you to the Jamboard that you will see on the screen right here. In order to make a questions, you can click this sticky note and then type it, and then you can save it and that will appear on the board. Now, um, yeah, also you can still put the questions in the chat box. So one of our interns will put your questions to the Jamboard for you. All right, so in the meantime, let me invite our guest speakers Again, either of you, you can go first and choose questions that you want to answer, and then we'll appreciate brief answers to questions so that we can hear as many questions as possible. Thank you. Can I just ask, Stella, could you make it a tiny bit larger? It's, it's sure, really sure. Perfect. Um, right here, yeah. We just can't see the sticky note on the top there, Stella. If you could move that down, the green one on the very top. Yeah. Oh, right here. Okay, gotcha. Okay, give me a moment. Yeah, it's not full screen. Um, I don't. If, should I should I pin it? Would that help? I don't know if I. Can. I don't think I can. That's that's good for me. Um, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll pick a couple of them. Um, I mean, firstly, that one that just got moved down, how should people who don't have any affiliation with or affiliation with any political party establish the right to assembly? I mean, the right to assembly is absolutely not uh, limited to political parties. Um, anyone uh, can assemble. Um, you can assemble uh, on any issue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a right which is um, uh, protected, you know, regardless of content or it's content neutrally protected, if you will. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can uh, assemble to uh, celebrate uh, Human Rights Day. For example, I guess there are some assemblies taking place around the world today uh, on that. Um, and hopefully most of those are not by political parties, but by, by, by human rights activists. Um, so I think, you know, I would, I would like to sort of quite dis distinctly um, uh, separate the issue of um, associating into a political party, which is part of the right to association and the right to assemble. Anyone can assemble at any time over any issue. Um, and I think, um, uh, I also maybe say a few words about the COVID. Um, and um, I mean, um, obviously, uh, protection of health um, is one of the uh, uh, grounds, of, you know, one for the rights of others, um, uh, uh, or, or, or of, of its own uh, uh, right, you know, reason to restrict uh, freedom of assembly, um, and uh, that has been done. Um, in, in countries around the world and also freedom of movement. Uh, so, you know, we, we've been told we can't go here and there and you know, we, we, we can only do it under certain conditions or whatever. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's uh, you know, that it, it is legitimate uh, where public health requirements require restrictions on freedom of assembly. Um, and I, I think it's interesting, I mean, I guess everyone will remember uh, the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States, which were taking place during a period of heightened uh, the, the COVID transmission, um, but yet were allowed, even though, or were mostly allowed, uh, uh, even though uh, there was a risk of, of, of COVID transmission, um, whereas uh, right to movement without being, a, being linked to the right to protest was, was you know, more heavily restricted in many cases. And I think that that was right and it reflected um, the, uh, the importance of uh, the right to peaceful assembly uh, to make those important points that were being made at that time versus just you know, our random movements and collecting together and having social events, uh, which are not so important and therefore on the necessity balancing uh, 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 were, were you know, 
it was more justifiable to restrict freedom of movement generally, and yet freedom of assembly in that important moment to make that important point uh, was allowed. So it's always a question of balancing. Um, I will say just from a personal point of view, although I'm a strong supporter of the restrictions uh, to protect COVID that we have put in place here in Canada and, and in other countries as well, and I mean, we've been somewhat successful in, in controlling the disease, I think there were also a lot of very knee-jerk reactions by the authorities. Uh, you know, they sort of, the, the go-to place often was to restrict. Uh, and, and international law you know, doesn't allow that. International law requires the authorities uh, when restricting human rights to be careful and measured and justified. Uh, the, 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 the rapidity with which COVID uh, came upon us and spread and things um, you know, justified uh, rapid reactions by authorities, but not thoughtless and silly reactions. Um, and there were some of those, I think. So, uh, and I'm sure that as we look back and as cases go through the courts, which is now happening, for example, in my country, uh, you know, we're going to find a more um, nuanced balance here. Actually, I don't know if you want to pick up some of the questions. Okay. Maybe I can. Uh, uh, I think you've dealt with the one on, um, on discrimination. I think the right to protest is uh, and the assembly is for everyone. It, uh, uh, either you are a political party, you are an individual, you are a registered entity, that right belongs to everyone. So it cannot be limited only to registered entity or political party or association. It's a right that is guaranteed you know, to, to every individual. It is an individual and a collective right. Uh, the one on the African and African Union, of course, most of the African, I would say almost, all the African uh, constitutions guarantee freedom of expression uh, in theory. What, what will happen in some constitutions, you will see uh, limitations that are not in line with international standards. Sometimes they are overbroad. Sometimes, you know, they, 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 they don't really permit for the right to be but normally, most of the, well, in general, all the constitution guarantee freedom of expression and to some extent, peaceful assembly or protest. Uh, sometimes in some constitution, you don't have the word protest as such. Uh, they will just have peaceful assembly. In a certain country, I know Senegal uh, is one of those countries where you have the right to protest as you know the new constitution guarantees the right to protest. Since 2000, it has been included in the constitution to automatically you know protect the protest protest is a right and um, you don't have to get a permit as such but it's a declaratory regime in most many countries across the continent uh, you have a declaration regime of declaration where you will just inform authorities but what we have what happens in reality is that even though it's a declaratory regime so that you don't have to have uh, authorization as such what we've seen uh, that process has been frustrated on uh, for national security. For example, today, like some groups uh, have wanted to protest, uh, and you know they were denied. They were denied uh, because of uh, national security, because of other. So they use quite a lot of national security argument also to 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 deny permit for protesters. In other countries, you have to have a specific permit, like in the Gambia. The law has not changed in many countries, especially Anglophone countries, where you have public order acts. Generally, you have to get a formal permit. And that also is sometimes subject to some discretion of the authorities, which makes it a quite difficult for people intending to protest. But freedom of expression generally guarantees across the board. Now, the nuances is the, on the limitation how some are very broad, some are really not in line with international standards. And also you have uh, secondary legislations that sometimes what is given in the constitution is denied somehow in other secondary legislation. But the right to protest is not unanimously guaranteed, but assembly and expression are generally guaranteed. I think Toby mentioned uh, already talk about national security issues. Um,
well, I think the impact we've all known, the, we have civicals, we have the, the, how to call it, the, 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 the comprehensive report on civicals. We have the different organization, including our own organization. In the different regions, we've uh, documented uh, the, the different uh, restrictions that happened last year and beginning of this year in different uh, uh, submissions. And we've seen that uh, many government use the COVID uh, pandemic also to crash on dissident and to crash on protesters. And that is also, uh, you know, that has also created a lot of frictions and a lot of tension in, in the different countries. We've seen what happened with the uh, anti sars movement in Nigeria. We've seen uh, people who have been beaten across Africa during those COVID restrictions. And at the end of the day, that has really moved people or mobilized people to, to protest government measures because they believe that uh, some of those measures were excessive and uh, government didn't give them space to, 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 to exercise their minimum right. So that has also led to many protests against COVID, COVID uh, uh, decisions. And in many countries, including uh, Senegal, Gambia, and some other countries, government at the end had to lift some of those measures because the tensions were so high. And I think uh, uh, it was really explosive at the end. So government had to really mellow down and, and reduce some of those uh, restrictions to allow people to go about their businesses. So I think what we can say in conclusion is that uh, government didn't communicate properly with citizenry. They didn't accommodate the citizens need most of the people who are unemployed, they don't have social security, they don't have a lot of unemployment benefit because they are in the informal sector. And when those measures just happen in a, in a, in very, very abrupt manner, many citizens felt that you know, their needs were not uh, taken into account. So they started to protest. And that also had, uh, we've seen a lot of brutalities in the streets, uh, in many streets. And at the end of the day, I think that created a lot of tensions across the continent. I think I'll stop there. Is there a time to come in again? Mm -hmm. Yes. Stella, sorry. Do I have oh, sorry about that. Yeah, no, we have uh, three minutes left. So um, maybe do you have any final comment in general that you want to talk to the people here? Well, I think I'd, I'd like to answer a couple more questions. And I, I think... Uh, Genoveva's question has to be answered uh, because somebody wouldn't answer her question before. Um, so, I mean, I think it's an interesting one. I, I think that, um, you know, uh, like in this case, we have a lot of questions and it's not possible for us to answer all of them. Uh, so I don't think we can say that not answering your question is a breach of your right to freedom of expression. It's just a reflection of the practical realities of, of a conference. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think if, uh, if there was a specific reason why your question wasn't answered because it was uncomfortable to the presenters or, uh, or, or or something like that, then then it might there might have been a freedom of expression um, element to it. I, I also, if I if I may, I'd like to just come on to this one about uh, hate uh, demonstrations. Um, so um, hate is a big term. International law uh, specifically requires states under Article Twenty. Two, so in between 19 and 21, the two rights that we're talking about requires states to ban a very narrow range of highly harmful speech, incitement to hatred, discrimination, or violence. Um, so on the basis of uh, nationality, race, or religion. So it's, it's, a, it's a narrow um, requirement to ban that speech. So that speech is not protected uh, speech. Uh, and uh, demonstrations or assemblies which um, uh, are specifically oriented to promoting that kind of value, that extreme kind of value, will also uh, fall outside of the scope of protection. But the, the question I'm trying to find, see it there, I can't see it, but... Uh, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, not to push the message of hate. Uh, that could uh, I don't know what you mean exactly by that, but that could be much bigger than this narrow band. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's um, it's 
it's protected. I'm just going to say legitimate. It's not legitimate, but it's protected uh, to have a racist demonstration, but not one that is so extreme that it falls within uh, the, the definition of hate speech uh, or hate, you know, incitement to hatred, I think. So um, we need to be careful here. Extreme, uh, uh, you know, demonstrations which promote extreme hatred values are not protected, but uh, just like speech, which is racist, is protect racist, but not hateful, let's say. I'm using language a little bit vaguely here because of time. Uh, and I think the same could be a set of, of, of assemblies. So only the most extreme uh, things would be bannable. Thank you for the, uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, comment. Um, Fitchu, do you have any one minute um, length of the, any comment, the final comment? Well, I, I see uh, some say hate speech, okay, but it depends on the jurisdiction, but in most African countries, uh, protests uh, that is hateful, I think when you have hate speech, it's not uh, generally accepted in most of the laws. So uh, it's kind of different from uh, the other jurisdiction in Europe where you can have uh, groups that are, you know, kind of discriminate, they can, you know, they can be allowed. I think these are also nuances that we need to make. It's not only violent speeches that are not allowed in most jurisdictions, but also sometimes hate speech can also uh, be, be, you know, when a protest is on about hate, generally also it's not allowed. But we, we are seeing that also uh, more and more that uh, uh, kind of the media, the media, uh, plays also a negative role in many places, especially looking at women's rights. When protests against violence against women, when, you know, other, other issues, we see that the media generally don't cooperate. You know, they, they either they, they continue to portray those as marginalized views. They also try to undermine and try to use stereotypes to discourage women who are also pushing for, for their rights. We've seen it quite a lot uh, when, when women's rights groups are trying to protest about violence, about especially when rape happens in society and there's no remedy, proper remedy uh, in courts or, 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 or in, in, so generally we don't see support from, from media, media, mainstream media especially. So this is something that we also need to look into and overall, I think protest has also been challenging because the mainstream media in many parts of the, 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 the continent, from Kenya, Senegal to uh, some of these places, they see protesters as troublemaker. And I think we need to have a mind shift, uh, some more human rights education, pushing them, encouraging them to understand that, you know, the media has a major role to play in, you know, giving the information accurately, but also being a voice for democratic values, but not for regression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, questions and answers. It was very productive and educational. So thanks for your active participation and answers. So now we are heading to the end of the webinar. So I'll play a three minute short video to demonstrate um, how to use the HREA Resource Center so this will guide you in finding a lot of HR um, and human rights education related sources based on your interests and needs. So here it is. Hi everyone, I'm on HREA website. You can see the resource center right here on the menu bar. Let's click search resource center. And you can see uh, we can search by human rights team or target group HRE strategy. Also, you can type any word based on your need and interest. Um, we'll explore this section shortly. Now, let's click human rights team first. And you can see a lot of categories based on the theme. So let me click freedom of assembly following our webinar theme right here, which indicate that we have 39 resources um, that's relevant to um, the assembly association at the resource center. Now by clicking it, it automatically sort resources out and you can see the bottom. Let me click one of them as example. And you can see 
the details of the resource right here, author and Yoruba publication, target group, and language and description, and the various uh, human rights theme that is relevant to, particularly relevant to this resource. Now, let me click the file link. This is the resource that you want to check out right here. Now let's go another option that we use for searching. Now, target group and HRE strategy. For example, let me click the education policy, curriculum development and resource that indicates 120 resources at the center. Now, let me also click the subcategory, for example, policies and regular, uh, regulatory framework that indicates we have 34 resources. Now, again, by clicking it, it automatically sort out and I can click one of it as an example. And you can see the same format of the resource. Now, author all the details about the resource. Now, let me click one more time to show you. It will lead you to the resource that you want to check out. Okay, lastly, we can also type any words that we might be interested in. So for example, test. And this is our webinar information because it has the protest, the word protest. And you can see a lot of resources that include the word protest. So for example, let me click one of it. And it has the same format of the resource that we saw previously. Now, let me click just one more time to see. So this resource that you want to check out now. If you find any resource that you found valuable to the public, you can click the submit a resource and please submit any resource that you want to uh, share right here. So, so this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching. All right. I hope you find it useful in terms of researching uh, for resources to utilize for your needs. Now, Dr. TV will conclude and then close our webinar by providing information about how to connect with HREA. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Stella, thank you for developing that, that video resource on how to access um, resources on our, on, in our online resource center at HREA, and especially those specific to today's um, topic. Um, warm thanks to our speakers, to Fatou, to Toby, um, and special thanks to Stella for organizing this on behalf of HREA. This was extremely informative. And I think that this area of, of freedom of assembly, right to protest, freedom of expression is one of those areas in human rights law, both international and regional, which really requires our studious understanding of definitions, right? Um, what is, what, when is, a speech, a hate speech considered hate speech, you know, for example, what is it, when do we consider it um, a, a signal to promote racism or um, inciting violence? And so in, in these matters, I really, I really have a great deal of respect for my colleagues who are, um, who are lawyers <laughs> in the human rights sector. So many thanks to those of you who have that background and shared it. Um, and for the great work that you're doing, um, Toby and Fatou, in this really important area. So many thanks to both of you. And again, to Stella and the team for today's webinar. So we are concluding today. I wanted to let those of you who are still with us know that you will be um, automatically added to the HREA um, list, sir, so that you're informed of future webinars, as well as other resources and opportunities in the international human rights education world. There is such a world. So, and if you would prefer not to be on that list, sir, you can always, of course, unsubscribe, but just so you know, uh, you'll be added um, automatically. Um, we would love to hear back from you, those of you who are still here on this, um, on this particular webinar. You can do so by uh, doing, going to the feedback survey, the survey there's a, a, a Q code there. Um, you're also, um, we'd also like to invite you to stay connected with HREA by connecting with us on Facebook, on Twitter, or LinkedIn. We're in all those places. Maybe you are too, we hope so. And then if, if you are, we, it would be terrific to, to connect up with you. Um, 
I think that's all um, all that I would like to say. Just again, thanks to everybody who joined us and to the team and wishing you a wonderful International Human Rights Day and successful human rights work in the in the year to come. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.